instead of talking about people as being open or closed, which is the way that the progressive institutions and media tends to frame people. You're either a xenophobe or you're open is the way they like to, to frame things, which is a very Manichaean kind of binary totalizing way of viewing the world. You could say, well, there are people who, who want change slower and people who want it faster. Uh, and we're gonna accept that people have these different predispositions and we're gonna come to an accommodation. That would be a mature grown up way of doing it. Hello, welcome to Nix. At Nix, we aim to foster a culture of thoughtful discussion and understanding that prevails over today's sensationalism and polarization. First, we're doing so by making nuanced discussions on controversial topics more available. If you would like to see more content like this and more of this value in the world, every share, like, and subscription helps. In this debate, we have Professor Philip Cunliffe and Professor Eric Kaufman discussing immigration, national sovereignty, and populism. You can find their bios and relevant links in the show notes. We hope you enjoy the debate. Okay, so thank you to both of you guys coming on. Uh, we'll basically discuss today the relationship between national sovereignty, immigration, and populism. Um, you guys have both written books about these subjects. And so I, I think my understanding is that you've come at them from slightly different angles, but ultimately end up with uh, a similar outlook on the situation. So it'll be interesting to hear how you guys discuss that today. But I think the first place to start is just to get each of your take on what you think the number one driver of populism is in the world today, because it is it does seem to be a trend, uh, given that, you know, the Dutch um, guy just won and then also uh, Malay down in Argentina. So it is a, a trend that is continuing. And so the the question, I don't know who wants to start first, maybe Philip, if you'd like to start first, what, what do you find is the, the number one reason why it's occurring? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Thane, and thanks for having me on. I'm looking forward to um, the opportunity to talk with Eric and to address some of these questions. So um, from my point of view, and this is certainly the argument that we take in um, the co-authored book that I wrote, Taking Control, Sovereignty and Democracy After Brexit, we see the core driver of populism as the decay of political representation over the last 30 years. And we frame it in terms of um, a concept that was popularized by the late um, Irish political scientist, Peter Mayer. And he talked in terms of the void by which he meant the gap that had opened up between the rulers and the ruled. So that civil society has effectively lost its um, bridgeheads in the state and the state has correspondingly lost its anchor in civil society. And as the two drift apart, you get the emergence of the void, the lack of institutionalized political representation. So we take populism as being a creature of the void, as we put it, just to say it's something which has emerged in order to try and um, in order to try and uh, recapture, I suppose, representation, but that it fails to do so because it's still shaped too much by the context of that void, the gap between the governed and the governing. So but the core, the, the most succinct answer I would, I would give to the question, um, as you've posed it, is the lack and the failure of political representation that roughly corresponds with the era of globalized neoliberalism over the last 30 to 40 years. That would be my first cut to the question in any case. It's a sort of opener to explain the, the rise. And I think it's worth mentioning that there's been a significant rise, let's say in Europe in two waves, uh, 1987 to the early 2000s, there was about a tripling of support uh, across certain countries, Italy, Austria, France, for example, Belgium. Um, then since 2014, we've seen another significant surge, which has now seen right-wing populism spread to most European, West European countries. There are a few exceptions. Ireland is one. Of course, we've seen some interesting things happening in Ireland, and it's not going to be, it's not clear to me how much longer Ireland will be an exception uh, to this pattern. But we've seen it in Britain, of course, with UKIP. We've seen places that were supposedly never going to get right-wing populism, like Germany with the AFD, Sweden, Sweden Democrats, uh, Portugal and Spain all have had now populist parties above 10%. So 
uh, not to mention, obviously, what's happened in the U.S. So I just think it's a very real thing, the rise of uh, right wing populism. This is not an imagination. Uh, and it's very much tied to uh, immigration. If you uh, there was a Sweden Democrat supporters, 99 percent say immigration to Sweden is too high. Uh, AFD supporters in, in Bavaria, 100% said Germany is gradually losing its culture. That just gives you a couple of, of, of markers there for what's going on. And there's a, a recent academic paper by Alexander Kustov and his colleagues showing that uh, actually uh, right-wing populists are voting on the basis of substantive issues. It's not just that they like somebody who's anti-establishment, but there are real core issues behind this. And East Asia does not have the same issues and therefore it's not having the same populism. And so I think that's sort of how I would explain what we're seeing. It's not entirely, look, there are other elements. And I think what Philip says is, is certainly a part of the picture, this fraying of ties between uh, individuals and elites, the social, civil society, loss of social capital. That's, that's absolutely right. Um, I just think that the bigger driver, at least when, when we're talking about Western right-wing populism, is the migration issue. Yeah, so I would, um, I wouldn't disagree with um, what Eric has said, but I suppose I would qualify it or add some riders to it. So I think there, I mean, you know, without a doubt, obviously populism is a, um, a historic phenomenon that has deep roots, both in Europe and especially Latin America. Um, but nonetheless, I do think there there are aspects of what's happening recently that are um, meaningfully that can be talked in meaningfully coherent terms at a global level. Um, so even though um, Latin American populism is very different in its origins and roots from, say, um, the populist parties that we're seeing break through into mainstream politics in Europe, for instance, at the moment, it nonetheless seems to me that they are all inflected in a similar way, um, partly because they borrow from each other um, in important ways and they take inspiration from each other um, and that they, um, you know, and that voters look abroad, you know, they look around and they see kind of similar phenomena in other countries and they um, recognize similar kinds of symbols and similar kinds of grievances, but also because there is, I think, um, there are global aspects to our political to the political impasse that we confront, um, particularly questions of political economy, um, the fading of a particular era of globalization, um, growing geopolitical rivalry, and that these uh, are the manifestations of these occur in different ways in different contexts, but that this, I think, inflects all populism around the world in a particular way, which isn't to say that you know there's no distinctions that can be meaningfully made at the national level. But only that I think the um, I wouldn't I wouldn't perhaps so in contrast to what Eric said, I wouldn't be so quick to say um, splice apart what's happened in Argentina with Mille from what's happening in other places. Um, so that would be one thought. And the other point about the um, you know I, um, about differentiating between the different kinds of populism, you know, I, obviously I, th I take the um, I take the description. Um, between the differences between left-wing and right-wing populism. But I would, again, I would come back to the point, I think, that both are shaped by both left and right-wing populism, um, are shaped by the lack of meaningful political voice in the part of constituents and voters, and that this is felt in common, though in different ways, in different contexts. It's nonetheless a common grievance, I think, around the world. And I would also, the other... Or well, the third element I would add to the picture that Eric point, um, painted just now is also, I think, partly the, the phenomena of right-wing populism is partly shaped by the defeat of left-wing populism, which isn't to say that left-wing populism has been um, entirely eliminated or contained or diffused, but only that it's confronted um, its own inadequacies, been forced to confront its own inadequacies much sooner than um, than right wing populists, and so I think it's partly the the fact that right wing populists seem to be surging ahead speaks to the fact that left wing populist movements have been defeated. And here I'm thinking in particular of Syriza, of course, in Greece when it capitulated to the Troika back in 2015, um, 
Jeremy Corbyn's defeat in the 2019 general election in the UK, um, Podemos becoming a prop effectively of the establishment socialist parties in Spain. Um, and so left-wing populism has um, enjoyed political defeats, I think. And so that's an element to add to the picture as well. Yeah, uh, well, I, I I would agree with a lot of that. I mean, I think, I, I suppose, hmm, I, I mean, I think if we take left-wing populism and right-wing populism in a Venn diagram, I think there is some overlap. We can see that perhaps with Bernie voters in West Virginia moving to Trump. There is a small overlap there. I still think that they're drawing from quite different uh, strata of the population that, that essentially the the left populists are drawing uh, as bernie did you know there is a substantial kind of university educated uh, younger um, kind of what ron Englehart would call a post-materialist uh, component to the left populist vote in a way um and i think that the values that they they stand for are, are considerably different from from those of the right populists. So I still think there's a lot of difference. I, I wouldn't expect much switching between those parties um, in the in the election data. If we look at the survey data, for example, I, it's relatively clear that, for example, and meta analyses of the quantitative immigration attitudes and populism literature kind of show this that. Um, Personal economic circumstances, job losses, uh, income, etc., are not a good predictor of whether you will vote for uh, right-wing populists. Um, they're a better predictor for left-wing populists, but certainly for right-wing populists, they're not. And this would this is partly why I would argue that that it, it's it's cultural values, uh, in particular around slow, you know, seeing ethno-cultural changes lost difference as more disorderly than as interesting. These are sort of deep psychological impulses, which are partly connected with education and class, but they're also partly independent of that. And you could see that even in the Trump vote in 2016, when roughly half of white college educated Americans voted for him. So it's not strictly limited to people of low income or who don't have degrees, even though that's important. There's no question that's important. Um, so I see this as more of a, in the West anyway, more of a values divide, a, a sort of cultural, a realignment away from the economic left-right issues, more to the cultural issues distinguishing between liberal or open so-called versus more conservative or so-called closed. I don't think those terms, I think those are very flattening terms, but um, essentially about orientations to whether the past should be like the present, whether difference is interesting or is disorderly. Um, and so you can take a question like things in Britain, you know, Brit British culture was better in the past. It's one one of the best questions for uh, teasing apart who voted for Brexit, for example, uh, much more so, much, much more so than class or income. Um, now, that's not to say, again, that, that class or income doesn't matter at all. It matters a little bit more so in Britain doesn't really, I would say it almost doesn't matter at all in the US. Uh, but I think this is really what we're talking about. We're talking about unprecedented ethno-demographic shifting. Uh, the U.S. going from something like 85% non-Hispanic white in 1960 to around 50% at mid-century. Canada going from something like 95% to around 50%. New Zealand in the same trajectory. And now, you know, Western Europe, it's towards the end of the century. These are really massive uh, ethno-demographic shifts. And where we've seen them in other countries like Ivory Coast, we've seen that kind of shift. You know, Lebanon, we've seen that kind of shift. We've seen a lot of tension around those issues. So it's not, I think, that surprising. Um, and literally, if you go back to the, similarly, in the U.S. past, for example, both the American Party and the 19, 1890s and the 1920s period, where you saw significant massive, you know, significant anti-Catholic populist movements, it was based around the same sorts of issues. So I don't think it's actually all that surprising what we're seeing. And I think it's very tied to uh, these particular cultural conjunctions. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I wouldn't, I mean, I certainly wouldn't deny the, um, the historic scale of what's happening in terms of mass migration around the world, including in Western states. And again, I mean, I wouldn't see it as surprising, particularly in terms of the fact that there's 
um, deep-seated unease and, um, you know, that we would expect some kind of political um, response. Um, I think where, I mean, and I, I don't know if, um, if you would agree with this or not, Eric, but the, um, I see it, I see these kinds of, um, in as much as there is electoral revolt, I nonetheless see it as mediated through, um, as I mentioned before, the failure of political representation. Um, so the fact that it takes a populist form, I think, is significant because it's to say that the established existing establishment parties or political elites, depending on what country you're talking about, um, are unable to manage or contain the extent of the grievance or the extent of the um, hostility or the extent of the feeling of being betrayed. They are unable to contain it um, or to give it expression or to, um, or to offer voters kind of meaningful alternatives and so this is why it takes, this is why, a, a, like you say, a predictable kind of electoral um, response takes this particular form. The other element I would say is also that these changes are, these enormous changes are the result of 30 years of a particular configuration of the global economy um, and political decisions that were made by um, established elites in particularly in the leading countries of the world, but you know, around the world in general, to participate in an open, globalized, integrated economy, to make efforts to reduce barriers to movement of people, and to ensure that political economy, particularly in Western countries, was built around importing cheap labor. And so the, the form of the electoral kind of unease and the form of the um, political response um, will, you know, I mean, it's unsurprising that it takes, um, that it takes uh, this, ex that it's expressed as unease about the pace of change, um, feelings of alienation with respect to how a neighborhood might change or how wider society is changing or um, the differing ethnic makeup of a particular neighborhood or city or country and so on. But that itself is an expression of a particular structural configuration of the global economy. And so it seems to me the two things are connected um, and it's uh, legitimate to try and see how the two things interact. So as Eric says, you know, voters, it's, it is, I mean, I, you know, I accept what he says about the way in which you might splice apart people's reasons for voting for particular parties. Um, but nonetheless, I think it's the, you know, we can say that it's the political expression of a response to and a reaction against a particular phase of world economy uh, at the highest level and in which given by its very nature because it was um, the period of high globalization by its very nature political elites around the world bought into this particular structure this particular configuration in all sorts of different ways um, but so those things are connected it seems to me and so it's possible to find common roots um, to them both in national contexts uh, but also to understand that the, um, you know, that the feeling of uh, unease and uh, alienation and the various kinds of deep rooted um, sense of grievance that Eric has talked about, I think that can be understood as, um, if not as voting, it's not voting on economic issues, the way that you might find if you ask people in a survey, you know, do you like, um, is your primary is your primary motivation for voting for this party a cultural one or economic one, and however you might split that up, but nonetheless, the that politics it seems to me can be traced and can be hung around um, major moments in the last in the history of the world in the last thirty years, um, and so it's not it seems to me significant that for instance that we begin to see. Um, you know, around in we begin to see these phenomena erupt at a particular point, and also at the same time. So, 2016 is a significant turning point because of the vote for Brexit and because of Trump's election to the White House. But it's also the tail end of the backwash of the economic crisis coming out of the 2008 Great Financial Crash. So, uh, Eric, unless you have uh, something to respond there, I was wondering if, if maybe we might, I think we've covered immigration fairly well. And uh, so 
please respond and end it off if you'd like. And then maybe we shift more towards the national sovereignty. Or Sorry, we've covered populism and immigration law, but I want to touch more on the national sovereignty part of it, um, if we could. So uh, if you have anything else to say on that, feel free, and then maybe we go there. Yeah, just to say, I, I agree with Phil that the, the economy does matter, um, especially upstream. So, you know, we one of the things we know, and again, studying um, the politics of immigration in the U.S., for example, going back into the 19th century and, and into the 20, early 20th century, is certainly that one of the main constituencies for more immigration has always been large business. Uh, business has always favored uh, immigration to, to lower labor costs. And that's exactly the same as, that, that's the same today. Um, this is a major part of the equation. So to the extent that a philosophy of globalization or neoliberalism is ascendant, particularly on, on the right and whoever's making up the right-wing parties, then you're going to get more of a pro-immigration consensus forming. So I think that's a, that's a very important point. And, and yeah, we had economic globalization sort of from the 70s to the, to the 90s and, and continuing really at quite a high level. So that's a very important context. Um, now, I do think there is a difference between countries such as in East Asia, like Singapore and, and Japan and Korea, who certainly are in the in the global marketplace and in, are engaged in economic globalization, but they have been much more reluctant to engage in freer movements of labor. So their foreign born percentages are much lower. I actually think that the movement of labor is a much more uh, radical change to a society than um, changes in the economic structure of a country. However wrenching that is, and it is really wrenching, there's no doubt about it. Um, and so societies that are not open to global migration, uh, I think are not, I would not predict that they would experience the, the same kind of populist upheavals we've seen in the West. That's an interesting point. So then moving more to the, the national sovereignty question, um, I guess one of my, my questions that I have along this end is what, what happens then if the popular will is to ultimately limit immigration? I mean, that seems to be, there's strong feelings on the popular will side, at least for a, a significant amount of constituencies that that is desired. I know that uh, in the US, I hear that all the time, at least just in the background, I'm, I'm less aware of what that's like in Europe, but what is to be done when there's this clash between what the demos wants and what the governing class, I guess, for lack of a better term, wants? How does that get resolved? Um, well, you know, I, I think this is the classic structure for populist voting, where you have a, a dissonance between the elite and uh, a significant chunk of the electorate. <clears throat> a lot of this is, by the way, happening within, in particular now, uh, the right-wing voting bloc, where, where the elites who are recruited, for example, the Conservative Party MPs are very socially liberal. Their voters are almost entirely in favor of immigration restriction. And so that this is where the, 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 the dissonance is happening with the conservatives here and in other places as well. And, and, and then you get a, a, a populist movement, a third party movement that sort of meets the demand that the established conservative parties won't meet. Um, and it's, it, you can almost think of it as a bit of a, like a, the Soviet Union, I use this example of where, you know, they, you can go to the government store and you can get one pair of pants, but if you want jeans or anything else, uh, you've got to go to the black market. And, and in a way, the populist is the political black marketeer that is ministering to the categories of demand that the mainstream parties won't address. And I, I actually think this isn't, they're not addressing it partly for business reasons, the business lobby and the neoliberalism that Phil talks about. But the other part of the equation in the West, which is very important, is um, cult cultural progressivism or, or, or what's now become cultural socialism, which is essentially to say that um, psychological, protecting uh, minority groups from psychological harm uh, and ensuring equal outcomes between uh, identity groups, that that becomes a dominant and increasingly powerful 
uh, strain within the ideology of the left becomes dominant within left-wing parties, uh, but also dominates essentially political culture, elite political culture. And what that does is it essentially prevents the political supply from, uh, at least the establishment political supply from ministering to the political demand of the base of voters. So you've got this mismatch between the suppliers who won't cross these red lines. They won't get, a, they, they don't want to cross the Overton window and, and minister to where most of their voters are. And that's kind of the, so I think it's a combination of both the, the economic business pressure and the cultural progressive pressure that's got gotten us into the situation we're in. Yeah, I would do, I would agree with that. I would frame it perhaps in different terms and how significant um, the different framing is, I suppose, is, you know, we can talk about that more if, um, if, um, if desired. Um, and I suppose our viewers and listeners can decide for themselves how significant the framing is. So what I would add to what I would add to what Eric has said is certainly I think I mean an important part of the story of neoliberal globalization over the last 30, 40 years is the fact that the um, left bought into it as well in different ways and in some ways became its most um, its uh, its greatest exponents. And a classic example of this would be Tony Blair, right? So that the ideology of the left um, or certain parts of the ideology of the left inherited from the 20th century, once hollowed out and remolded, you know, formed excellent ideological vessels for these policies of um, neoliberal globalization. And this formed part of the consensus in the um, high point of the, across the high point of neoliberal globalization in the 90s and in the 2000s. So I'd agree with Eric that part of the, um, part of the problem today, part of the institutional and political rigidity and the failure of our institutions to adapt to meet um, the grievances of the electorate is this deeply entrenched new elite, um, which is the way it's been termed by our, um, our colleague, Matt, Matthew Goodwin. Um, I would call it the professional managerial class because I think it's more, um, more accurate in terms of describing the kinds of um, niches that these kinds of individuals tend to occupy and also how it shapes their outlook. But I mean, I, I don't want to get precious about um, the new elite debate because I understand that people, you know, talk about it in different ways. And I am, you know, I can, I think we can understand. It's easy to reach a kind of an agreement about um, the kinds of groups that we're talking about. And so they're very, they're a very important part of the picture. I wouldn't disagree. Um, and the fact that political elites are, um, that their values are so kind of uh, in tune with, the values of this larger professional managerial class is an important part of this. The, I suppose the element that I would add that, um, that Eric didn't mention was my expectation is that populism will fail. And indeed that it has been shown to fail um, over, the, in, you know, over the last 10 years or so. So for instance, I think um, you know, that's evidence say with Giorgia Maloney in Italy, um, who was very vocal about her Euroscepticism um, but now that she's in government is very much playing the same game as the Italian political elite has been doing since the 1990s, which is blaming Brussels for the inability to do certain kinds of things. And so in Giorgio Maloney's case, she's blaming Brussels for the migrant crisis that Italy confronts. And so I think that is typical of populism, is that it will be unable to address the grievances that brings them into power or, you know, a butting power or that propels them into the national arena. They will systematically fail. And that's because they are, as I, um, at least by my reading, that's because they are, as I mentioned at the beginning, creatures of the void. They're unable to transcend the void. They're unable to build new forms of representation um, and to channel those grievances effectively. And so, I mean, it's not a common, it's not, sorry, it's not an original criticism. I know other people have made this criticism, but I would say it, speaks to the fact that populists are part of the problem as well. So it's not only the PMC or the new elite, and or um, as Eric um, put it, as Eric would put it, the cultural socialists, I think the populists are also part of the problem. They're part of the logjam. And the only way we get through is by um, strengthening the popular will. Um, and this means um, in, you know, to contain the influence of the professional managerial class, but also breaking apart the populists, because I don't see that they offer any viable means to address our problems 
Um, yeah, interesting there. A lot to a lot to chew over. Um, some agreement. I mean, I think I, I see populism as double edged. I mean, I think they can be intemperate. They can be they can fan hatred of minority groups. They can be emotional instead of solution based and evidence based. But equally, they can bring in new categories of demand that are not being addressed, new groups of voters that are not, uh, whose concerns are not being listened to. I do think they have a role, have many parties, of course, the Democrats in the U.S. would be one, uh, you know, many parties begin as, as populist parties and then become established. <laughs> I also think that uh, populists influence the center. For, so, for example, you can see the the center left in Denmark, the center right in Sweden. Uh, they're talking about migration now seriously in a way they were scared to do um, in the past. Uh, the Quebec, you know, just to take a, a case where speech restrictions are at the elite level are not quite as stringent in Quebec as they are in English Canada, which has allowed, I think, for politics to better represent the range of views of voters. You now have the CAQ, for example, uh, for the first time said they wanted migration reduced in Quebec. Now, the mainstream left-wing nationalist party, uh, the PQ, is, is uh, following suit. And similarly, in, in other European countries like Germany. So I actually, you could look to Britain where the UK Independence Party uh, influenced the Conservative Party to hold a referendum. I, I think, therefore, I, I would sort of argue that populists can do, you know, they can be nefarious, you know, but on the other hand, they force the political marketplace to represent um, groups of people that are not being represented. Now, of course, there are times when you want the political establishment to erect a cordon sanitaire and keep certain parties out of the system. I, I think, you know, George Wallace talking about segregation in 1968, you know, he got whatever it was, 13% of the vote, but I think it was the right move to freeze him out of the system. I, I don't think that's the case on the immigration issue, which I think is a very legitimate issue to discuss. And I think it's illegitimate that uh, that issue has been essentially sidelined, or you can only discuss it in certain ways. And again, that reflects that sort of dominance of the cultural progressive uh, Overton window, which is narrowed. Uh, it's been narrow for many decades, to be fair, but it did at, at one point become harder. I mean, even if you look at the U.S. and the Democrats, oh, but the way Obama talked about deportation and border control, really, even between his first and second terms, you saw a shift in emphasis, and now it would be impossible to for any Democrat to use that kind of uh, language. And, and I just think that that's simply a recipe for uh, populism, you know, some kind of populism emerging in response to that failure of, of the elite because they got that straitjacket, uh, this overly broad uh, definition of racism and an over correspondingly overly narrow Overton window of what can be democratically discussed and debated. So I think there, there definitely is a, a role for populism. And I think it, it can play, it's the only outlet. And in, there have been studies that show, you know, when populists are doing well, say in Germany, you actually see a reduction in far right street attacks and vice versa across Europe. I, so I don't think the argument somehow, but equally, there's no question that populists are loose cannons and they aren't always, you know, often they're not rational and they often say nasty things about immigrants, for example. So you, you clearly would rather somebody from the mainstream of the system, in fact, be addressing these issues rather than the populace. But I think as long as the mainstream is doubling down on their speech restrictions and what's acceptable and has too, too bloated a conception of uh, racism, then I think we're going to continue to see this. Did, uh, I'm not sure if you're experiencing this as well, Philip, but I think uh, Eric has frozen on me. Yeah, Eric has frozen for me. It was a bit garbled at times. I think I got most of it, but... Okay. <laughs> well, maybe if you want to try and take your... Well, I want to make... I'm not sure if he can hear us, so maybe I'll just... Yeah, I can hear you. ...something in the, the chat really quick. But as I understand it, he basically was saying that there is some sort of role 
for populism in shifting the conversation and bringing on more supply. Uh, I think, and maybe you can kind of speak on this. Sure. Your point seems to be more that uh, the populist party themselves just doesn't actually have the capability to act independently to fix the problem. Is that kind of what your point is? Yeah. Uh, can you hear us, Eric? Are you back? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah we just broke up for a second, but now I, now we can. Okay. All um, right. I think um, we can, the the majority of what of what your point was though, which is that um, the 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 populist parties can act as a sort of uh, way to bring on more political supply uh, and different options, and it maybe isn't necessarily that uh, that's always that they're the option that people go with, but because they shift the whole conversation, all parties involved will now, you know, shift and th thus lead to more supply overall, more, more options for people. Yeah. Yeah. So I sort of, I don't know what was included, but I sort of said there are times when freezing a party out is uh, morally justified. Correct. And there are times when it's in fact, not morally justified. And I would argue Certainly around immigration, most of that freezing out has been not morally justified. Um, and the reticence of the mainstream parties to, to uh, accept the legitimacy of this issue has created a market um, and has led to you know, a loss of voice for people who found it in the, in the populist parties. And I've also argued that uh, there are all kinds of, you know, in, to some degree, it's a, a safety valve. And, and if you look at the data on right wing, for example, right wing violence, uh, street violence, for example, it, it sort of has an inverse relationship. Um, I think Jacob Ravindal has, has done research on this. It sort of has an inverse re relationship to the success of populist right parties. So there is some degree to which this is a democratic outlet. But having said that, obviously, you don't want a party that's going to be uh, inciting hatred against uh, identifiable, identifiable groups, which is all the more reason why the mainstream parties, I think, need to stop operating with this sort of very bloated definition of racism and uh, correspondingly very narrow Averton window of acceptable debate. We, we've seen the populace sort of break that open a little bit in, in uh, Europe. Uh, and I think that's been a good thing. And I think if you look at... Um, yeah, so you can now see mainstream parties addressing these grievances in in Denmark, for example, and increasingly in other European countries. Um, I actually think that's democracy working. Uh, where, and, and now, if if it, it got to the situation of expelling people, then that's clearly a violation of people's rights, and uh, such such parties should be frozen out. So it just depends. I imagine George Wallace is, as an example, a segregationist third party. He, absolutely correct to freeze him out. Um, so these are these are not sort of straightforward decisions. But I just think on the on the migration issue, I, I think progressivism has stretched the meaning and weaponized racism as a as a sort of uh, a, as a tool to shut down debate to ensure that they're able to get their way uh, in certain policy areas, and that's that's had a very negative um, blowback effect. I would I would argue. So if I um. I think, I mean, if I've understood uh, Eric, I don't disagree with him. Um, I certainly don't disagree with his characterization of the um, of the role that populists have generally played. I suppose I what I what I doubt is that it's um, I suppose uh, effective. I don't because this. I mean, as Eric puts it, that in terms of them helping to kind of uh, adapt the political center or the political right to. Um, address voters' concerns, the very fact that essentially populists act as pressure, external pressure groups on these parties gives these parties a new lease of life. Um, and it helps them to, you know, it helps them to uh, become more effective. And so, and that seems to me to exacerbate our problem ultimately, um, at least in um, the Western, established Western democracies. So that insofar as populism works, it works to prop up existing parties, systems, existing parties, either by forcing them into coalitions or by forcing them to um, go for the kind of what's uh, left out of the mar political marketplace, as Eric said. 
And the reason this seems to me problematic is because I don't think the established um, parties are up to the tasks that really confront us as we need to remake, um, I mean, not only national societies, but the world economy as a whole in the aftermath of the era of, neo of neoliberal globalization. And it doesn't seem to me that there is really any existing party that's up to that challenge. And in Western societies, the scale of what's required is nothing less, I think, than nation building effectively, that we need new nations, um, new nation states, democratic nation states, sovereign nation states, Partly, not least in response to the world historic kind of unprecedented scale of the cultural and racial ethnic changes that Eric has mentioned. And that is a tremendous task. Um, you know, the scale of political integration and social integration that's needed in countries throughout Europe, and I hazard to say in the US itself, um, is something which I think is beyond the existing parties. So in as much as the populists either fail in power or help to prop up the existing party system. Again, it seems to me that they're part of the problem. Yeah, um, interesting food for thought. And I'm, I'm <laughs> trying to think of the, what a reconfigured, I mean, I think I would agree with Phil's emphasis on, on the fraying of ties between the average citizen and their political representative, representatives the mass mass member party and union and church and all of these institutions that Robert Putnam talks about declining uh, since 1960. I mean, th I think that is a, a crisis in the social fabric. And I, I think I would agree that some sort of rebuilding of that is, is bound to be necessary. Um, however, I, I also think, I mean, and I don't, I'm not sure this is a disagreement, um, but it's, I do think that the strain of the left that has emerged, the cultural turn of the left post 1960s, and that's not just the radical left shifting from Marxism to Marcusean kind of identity politics, but also the liberal left becoming much more focused on race, gender, sexuality, much more focused on psychotherapeutic, so-called emotional safety and harm protection, victimhood culture, and this sort of, that direction really, um, which has, you know, th the temperature has been turning up on that. You, you know, we start with sensitivity training in the 1960s, move to um, diversity, the term diversity in the 1980s to inclusion to critical race and gender ideology in the 2010s. So cranking and rationing up of this, essentially the spreading, partly because as I, I mean, I talk about this in my next book, we haven't yet figured out a way to uh, create guardrails around the sacred totems of the new left, essentially around racism and to some degree sexism and um, issues around, say, transphobia, homophobia. I mean, these are all linked to the race taboo, which emerges in the 60s, which in some ways is a good thing, but in some ways is unbounded. And therefore, there's nothing to, to resist this concept creeping. Uh, and we're kind of living through that, really. I mean, in a way, dragging immigration in, in as part of the definition of racism um, is an example of the concept creep of the term racism. And we've seen that now expand to things like standardized testing and, and all kinds of other domains as this ideology has essentially gone extreme. But um, oh, trying to find a way to sort of moderate this elite ideology, I mean, without that, we are going to be locked in a perpetual cycle of populism and polarization, which we haven't talked as much about, but polarization is another part of this because essentially the those who, who are more sympathetic to that elite cultural left project react to populism by accusing the populace again. Not so. First of all, they say talking about immigration is racist. When the populists talk about immigration, they accuse them of being racist. That then leads to a, a kind of counter reaction, accusing you know the elite of, of essentially condescending, and you're into this recursive radicalization, polarization process, which uh, is exemplified in the culture wars. And I think we sort of are seeing that ripping apart society after society in the West, I think it stems from this fundamental 
kind of problem at the heart of left-wing ideology and the need to sort of moderate and restrain which, that ideology. And that has not occurred um, until it does, until we get a rethink. Instead, what's happened is that ideology has taken over more and more sectors of elite society and elite institution. Until we're able to roll that back significantly and moderate it and make it rational, I don't see an end to what we're, what we're going through. Yeah, I think I would agree with that. I mean, I think it's one of the main tasks, in fact, of um, political tasks that confront us as societies is bridling the professional managerial class and making them accept and submit majority rule, essentially, um, you know, to put it in as plain as plain terms as I can, um, that they need to accept democratic mass politics as the framework within which they're bound to participate. And so these the kind of some of the behaviors that Eric has described, the attempt to consistently delegitimate majority opinion or seek to outflank it or subvert it um, and delegitimize it in all sorts of ways, calling it into question. All of that, I think, is part of that process, and it is something which needs to be contained and um, fought back against. And that, I think, is also um, part of that task of nation building, I think, because it means creating a coherent national level framework within which, which people accept as the political vessel for channeling their particular aims and political aspirations. And that goes, I mean, that it is, uh, that's partly, I mean, that partly includes rebuilding um, social capital, to use uh, the, the Putnam idea. It partly includes that, but it also goes beyond it. And it's a political, I mean, it, it's a project which has distinctive political aspects that are not just social or cultural. Um, and it requires, I think, partly um, enhancing political representation. So giving, making the kinds of institutional changes that would give people greater voice and perhaps help them avoid um, the kind of political black marketeering that Eric mentioned earlier. So to give them the institutionalized way to express themselves and to give them greater control over the conditions of their collective life that would make populism if not eliminated entirely, because I'm not sure that it, populism can ever be eliminated as a political phenomen phenomenon, I think that's probably unlikely, but at least that the that we return to um, a situation in which we have a meaningful political competition for power, democratic national power between political parties that are consolidated, established and have constituents that they are understood to represent their interests as part of a national political process. And it seems to me that those are things that we lack um, in Western societies at the moment, partly as a result of the, you know, all the things that we've been talking about and the phenomena that Eric describes. And yeah, so to defeat that elite ideology, I think it's, um, it's the task of democratic politics. Yeah, I mean, completely completely agree with that. And I mean, I think just to, just to be a bit more concrete about why we're seeing this polarization and splitting, I mean, I think part of what's going on is, you know, when, if you think about the economy, free markets versus redistribution, um, you know, we, we sort of have an acceptance that, you know, you have to have a, a welfare state, and we can argue about the size of the, the tax level. We can argue about uh, what should be public and what should be private. But basically, we're not going to allow people to die on the street um, in most countries. Um, and arguably, we would like to have a certain level of equality. Um, on the other hand, we, we need to have, we, don't, we can't crowd out capital, we need to have economic growth and, and business formation and, and so on. So it's a balance. I think a lot of people accept that. And that's one of the reasons I think that the we don't necessarily see polarization on the economic dimension. The cultural questions, I think, are more or have been more zero sum um, with one side pushing essentially towards an almost open borders uh, and, and, a, and a very sort of a, a, a kind of shameful view of the past. Uh, essentially inverting social pyramids um, so that, that certain groups are the oppressed are seen as, as having 
you know, deeper insight into the human condition and deeper value in their, their cultures are, are sort of looked at in a somewhat romantic way while the culture of the oppressors are sort of raked over for the slightest infringements. Um, so you have that kind of c cultural paradigm on the one hand. On the other hand, you just have this, this reactive blowback uh, on behalf of, you know, what was what were essentially the dominant views of, of majorities of the population. Um, and because, cult I mean, culture is zero sum in a way, but it doesn't have to be. I mean, I think, for example, on immigration, instead of talking about people as being open or closed, which is the way that the progressive institutions and media tends to frame people, you're either a xenophobe or you're open is the way they like to, to frame things, which is a very Manichaean kind of binary totalizing way of viewing the world. You could say, well, there are people who, who want change slower and people who want it faster. Uh, and we're gonna accept that people have these different predispositions and we're gonna come to an accommodation. That would be a mature grown up way of doing it. And, and we can talk about cultural, ethnocultural change, how fast it should be, uh, assimilation. Let's talk about evidence about how quickly it's proceeding. You know, that would be what a mature society would do. Uh, instead, it's you're a racist, you're a bigot, you're a xenophobe, or you're open. That's sort of the level of debate around these these questions. Um, and so, yeah, I think, and, and because, you know, there's no question that the populists are, you know, saying awful things about immigrants on occasion, uh, certain ones more than others, which I'm very critical of. But I, equally, I think that the inflexibility on the progressive side, the, the sort of utopianism, um, the sort of monism there that doesn't allow for any sort of flexibility really um, is an enormous problem, especially because such groups are in, are in a dominant position, either directly because they are the numerical majority or because they are controlling taboos and limits around what people can discuss. Um, they are able, therefore, to essentially have a lot more power in the society. They're at much closer to the heart of power in society. Um, and that's why I think it's incumbent upon them to, uh, to reform and to change more than anyone else. And I think if they do, then trust can be restored to these institutions, to the elites, and the dynamics behind populism can start to break down. That's how I would tend to see it happening. Not that that's going to happen anytime soon. <laughs> Yeah, I would, um, again, I think, I mean, I would agree with a lot of the substance of what Eric has said and maybe reframe it um, or add, you know, a few caveats. But the, I mean, from my point of view, the, it seems to me this, what I would call, what Eric has described, and I would be happy to call intersectionalist ideology, it seems to me it's very compatible with um, the kinds of, um, well, compatible essentially with neoliberalism. In the sense of its its political organization is essentially anti-majoritarian. Its intent and its design is to frustrate the ability to form um, majority views. It's intended to dissolve majoritarianism by fragmenting it across all sorts of different identities, and also that those identities are framed in such ways that um, they cannot be meaningfully politically synthesized. And so it's always experienced as this kind of uh, hostile private assault rather than a disagreement about um, a particular policy by the state or about, a say, how to use state power or about the um, purpose of politics or what have you. It's always it becomes something which is experienced as um, hostile to your existence as an individual. And so it's partly the privatized character of the intersectional identities that I think makes these debates so vicious and intense and so politic and at the same time, so politically unproductive. Um, and so I think, again, I mean, I would, you know, I think the, um, the, the task to, to do that is, um, is essentially one of nation building. It's a momentous task of creating political institutions anew. And so, I think, I mean, it means remolding some of our existing institutions, but it also means building new ones, new political institutions, but also, I suppose, new cultural institutions as well to complement them. New political parties um, that are more successful, hopefully, than populist parties, 
And again, it's something which I think, as Eric has suggested, and I would agree, I think it would be something on the scale of a of a generational of a generational task, um, not something that could be you know addressed in a single electoral cycle or even a few electoral cycles. Um, but it's also it's to stress that the I think the scale of the you know the need to absorb say um, uh, foreign born populations in Western societies as well as um, at the same time the just the um, the kind of rampant anomie and atomization and lack of integration into all sorts of social and political structures and institutions. That is something which I would encompass under the term nation building. Um, and that is what I think is um, what is uh, left to us at the mo you know, in as we exit uh, the prior 40 years era of neoliberal globalization. I suppose one, I would only add maybe one moment where perhaps I'm more hopeful than Eric is. I partly see the viciousness and intensity of these struggles of the moment as partly defensiveness on the part of the um, professional managerial class, that in some respects they're fighting a rearguard action. And so this is what gives makes them especially um, uh, hostile. It's partly because they're on the back foot and they experience themselves as being um, beleaguered and under siege by um, the peasants with the pitchforks, who is you know kind of the electorate at large, the majority. And so this is why... Mm -hmm. This is why um, these discussions about what goes on a history curriculum, you know, about what school kids are taught, um, about kind of popular attitudes, about commemoration of national public, um, uh, you know, uh, holidays or events or what have you, or an historic anniversaries. It's partly because they're so defensive or their defensiveness, I think, is expressed in terms of this hostility and viciousness. And so this is why the temperature is so high in um, public institutions such as universities, public bodies, um, museums, schools, educational um, institutions, and so on. Interesting. Well, is there any more? We're, at, we're coming up on an hour. Um, is there any other directions that you guys would like to go? I mean, I think that has been a pretty darn good fleshing out of these different of the different tracks that we can take within this conversation. But is there any other uh, places that you guys wanted to touch on? Well, no, I, I think, um, you know, I think we've covered a lot of a lot I of aspects. Give, I mean, I'd maybe give one, which is. Yeah. No, go ahead, Phil. Yeah, go on, Eric. Oh, no, just just to, to say that uh, I think there's uh, sort of there key there can be these interactions uh, between the progressive and the neoliberal. So this term progressive neoliberalism is sometimes used as the dominant philosophy uh, of our time. A good example of where I'm from, Vancouver, just north of where you are, um, they tried to, they, they were talking about bringing in a foreign buyer tax on homes because there's a very inflated housing market. Um, and the developers were in league with the social justice activists to call this a racist policy. It was, uh, only when polls showed it was backed by 90% of the city's residents of all races that eventually, eventually they were able to get it, th get it through. I think this sort of shows you the power of this taboo. Uh, and, and now in this, obviously it meshed well with the developers and their uh, commercial interests. But I think it's just a very powerful uh, elite coalition there. And, and I just, you know, at how they are ever going to sort of moderate. I mean, this is really the question. You could see it in, you know, some of the elections that took place in West Coast cities where, D, you know, the DA in San Francisco and in Seattle, you had some political change. You know, are some of the downstream effects of this ideology in terms of homelessness and crime and, and, and violence eventually going to force a rethink? That's another area of hope. Um, so maybe just confronting the results the problem is, of course, that that will all be spun memory hold in such a way that the progressive left doesn't have to face the consequences of its policies. Right. And, and that's the danger. But maybe for the electorate, more of the electorate, I think these things are percolating every five years. They're getting a better understanding of what's hap what's being taught in schools, what, you know, what, what's happening in institutions. Maybe that will lead to some kind of pushback and some sort of reform. 
uh, if the left starts to lose elections uh, because of these views, then I think you are, stand a chance of emboldening the center left and weakening the power of this ideology. Yeah, I mean, I would I would agree with that. I don't. You had something that uh, you wanted to say as as well, Philip. Yeah, only to mention um, something which we didn't pick up on, um, but I think is an important part of the picture, even if um, in the background for now, but that is the idea of sovereignty, because I think it's only with a um, clear and identifiable focus of power that it becomes possible to engage in the kinds of changes um, that we've talked about, the kinds of changes that we think would be desirable for different reasons and in different ways. Um, but it requires um, the acceptance of centralized public authority. And I think that's partly what's lacking. Um, and that has been very, um, you know, that lack of um, political acceptance of centralized authority has been a very important part of the way in which neoliberal globalization has functioned, its hostility to the sovereign state in all sorts of very just various ways over the last 30 years. And so I think building, rebuilding that um, willingness to accept centralized public authority, it has to be a bedrock of any of the um, democratic improvements that we might wish to see. Um, and will also, by its nature, I think, help to break down um, intersectionalist ideology, precisely because intersectionalist ideology is so hostile to centralized forms of authority that are based on majority rule. So building sovereignty, I think, or um, strengthening sovereignty and strengthening public authority, concentrating power in public hands is a vital part of the task of nation building. Yeah, actually, it's interesting you mentioned that to kind of tie, I think that's becoming a more uh, credible idea, uh, kind of piggybacking off of what you had said earlier, Eric, with kind of how the West Coast cities have changed and there's more recognition of where the results of the lack of what you were just mentioning has caused problems. It seems like the, it's almost like if, uh, you know, you're, you're graphing out uh, progress towards an end, the derivative of, of way, or the derivative of change towards intersectionalist uh, outcomes is changing. I think people are recognizing it's almost like we're rounding off uh you know, moving in that direction and starting to move more in the other direction because of the recognition uh, that Eric mentioned and now more towards what you are calling for, uh, Philip. I don't know if you guys have experienced that too, but I, yeah, I, I would mean, say that it, on the ground, I've experienced that, uh, at least in Seattle. Yeah, it's really interesting you mentioned this because there are certain indicators, you know, there's a general view in cultural sociology that, that a lot of attitude indicators have been moving in the progressive direction on a whole. And most of that, many of the things I would agree with those, you know, like gay rights, for example. But um, one of the things we've just noticed in the last few years is on something, an issue such as um, transgender women accessing uh, female sports and spaces. Um, that there's now been a shift away from that of sort of 20 points or thereabouts in some of the attitude surveys, both sides of the Atlantic. And so perhaps this is some sense that maybe we're hit, we've hit a limit, maybe, maybe the, what seemed like this inevitable movement towards ever more kind of progressive on what Jonathan Haidt would call the care, harm and equality dimensions, equal outcomes dimensions, that that's maybe starting at least to hit some limits in public opinion. So maybe that's a, a sign that we might be moving, hopefully back to the center. Yeah, you came through a little uh, garbled for me, but I think I more or less caught what you were saying there that, yeah, it, it, it seems as though there's, you know, there's almost like a limit graphically that we're hitting and we're coming up on that asymptote and it's now, it's now going to stop if not, maybe move to the, to the opposite direction and hopefully, you know, have a, have an acetone on the other side. So we don't go wholesale across yeah. the other way, which I think is like what some people are maybe worried about uh, on the other side. But yeah. Yeah. Well, any, any other uh, final thoughts, gentlemen, I, I might kind of keep it here just to prevent it from being too long. Uh, but if there are other directions that you wanted to explore, we certainly could do so for a little while. 
there was nothing in particular I wanted to mention. I mean, um, beyond what has already been said, and I've enjoyed the discussion a great deal. Um, and it's, I always, you know, I always, um, ever since Eric came to visit me when I worked back at the University of Kent, well, to visit the department where I worked at the time, I've always um, learned things from what he said. So it's been a very useful discussion. Um, I Thinking about what you mentioned about the West Coast cities, I know like um, I saw on social media that they, San Francisco went through a great cleanup in advance of Xi Jinping's arrival. And it just reminded me of like the stories you'd read about from the Eastern Bloc in the Cold War when visiting foreign <laughs> dignitaries would arrive, you know, there'd be a lick of paint thrown on the buildings, but otherwise they'd be allowed to kind of regress to their usual dismal state. And it sounded to me a very similar story in San Francisco, you know, in terms of the kind of um, decrepit character of public public space and life there. So hopefully, you know, I mean, hopefully people will hopefully people will begin to see that, you know, that you can't just kind of um, clean down the streets for the sake of a foreign dignitary, but that it has to be an accept, you know, un unacceptable to live in this way in future, both for, you know, not least for the people who are themselves homeless. Yeah, they, they got called out quite uh, handedly uh, for that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Eric's overall characterization that there just seems to be this people are seeing it more. It's getting, it, whenever you see something and then it then gets uh, a label to to demarcate what it is, the phenomenon that you're seeing, it becomes easier and more in your conscience. And I, I think uh, that's happening now over and over to a point where it just, we cannot keep going uh, on the path that has been. It's just, there's too many psychological markers that are preventing that from happening, I think at this point. Uh, too many blatantly obvious examples of where it breaks down. So, well, well awesome. Thank, thank you guys both for coming on. Everyone should really read their books, read White okay. Shift, read Taking Control. Uh, they're they're both quite interesting and informative books. I thought the takes were quite good, and I have definitely learned something by reading them. So, um, people should do that. But yeah, thank you very very much, you guys. I really appreciate it. I learned quite a bit by listening to this. Thanks a lot, Thanks, Thane, and thanks, Phil. Great to talk to you. Very enjoyable. Okay. We hope you enjoyed this next debate. For more, remember to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Twitter at the underscore Nix. We'll see you next time.